Welcome to a reading of an essay entitled The East End Boys, was first published in the Canadian Alpine Journal uh, for 1998. Uh, later it was published in a collection of my essays uh, entitled The Rage, which was uh, published in 2005. Um, I'll be reading from the, the version that was published in the Canadian Alpine Journal in 1988. Uh, this essay that year also won the Best of the Journal Award um, for, uh, for 1998. The East End Boys, June 1986. My 1974 for Nova roared as late on my way to the job site, I raced down the cloud trail. While I drove, I pulled my head, one arm and then the other through my paint covered college pro painters t-shirt. My nostrils twitched at the odor of the paint and sweat embedded in the fabric. As I rolled down the window, the car's roar intensified and I made a mental note to buy some canned soup for dinner to pick up some coat hangers. The soup tins and hangers would be useful for fixing the holes in my exhaust system. The suspension bottomed out hard when I hit a slight rise in the road. I cringed at the vibration in my feet as it hammered through the rusted steel floor. When the rattling subsided, I found I had to hold the steering wheel at a 90 degree angle to make the car go straight. No problem, just one more nuance. 150 feet further, the front end lurched upward until I could not see the road anymore. It came down in a nosedive, screeching and squealing as I skidded to a halt. Jumping out, I found the wheel on its side, wedged under the car. Hmm. The ball joint had ripped out. I was going to be very late now. Rifling through my pack, I found my camera. Traffic backed up behind me. Setting the camera on the nearby bridge, I crouched next to, next to the wheel and posed, smiling for several self-timer shots. A parade of frowning and agitated suit and tie guys wheeled around the bottleneck created by my photo shoot. As I ambled over to a payphone to call a tow truck, I, re I relived pitch four from our climb on Yamniska's East End Boys the day before. Near the top of the gently impending crack, both fin fists began to creep out simultaneously. There was, an unreasonable, there was a reasonable jam down at the level of my shins. I knew that if I removed either of my two hands, the other would pull. After a quick assessment of the situation, I decided my only option was to do a kind of downward lunge to the lower jam. I knew I would take a shorty onto the number four friend if I missed it. I poised myself for the effort. My taped hands crept toward the outside of the crack half a millimeter at a time. I had only seconds to attempt this with any control. Watch this here, Bill. I went for it and missed. Bill recollects. I felt the rope come tight and then go slack. I knew at that moment that the piece had pulled. I'd never seen anyone fall past me before, and I braced myself to see it for the first time. I locked my eyes open and my hand on the stitch plate. The rope came tight with a violence I didn't expect, and I was slammed upward against a small roof. Steve was upside down beside me. The gear clanked as he righted himself. My back was bleeding. Steve and I stared at each other. I had only known Steve for a week and was unsure how he would respond after an 80-foot screamer. You okay, Bill? I'm okay. Are you okay? I'm okay. Steve glanced down and unclipped the friend from the rope at his waist. The friend pulled. He glanced back up at the high point. Guess I'd better get back up there before I get scared. 
East End Boys, 511A3. A quintessential creation from that era of my life. Right after the first ascent, I had wanted to go back and attempt a free ascent. For a few years, I was distracted by other projects. In 1990, however, I more or less lost interest in hard climbing. The fire died, and with it, the passion for pushing my limits on rock. In retrospect, it was around that time that I became closed emotionally, and that my penchant for intimate relationships disappeared. Both are forms of passion. Both involve intimacy and risk. Shutting down emotionally and compartmentalizing pain, fear, and insecurity became a crutch that helped me through some tough times. As much as I wanted my primal instincts to overwhelm my psyche and provide me with an intellectual, physical, and emotional focus, they never returned. I would commit neither to a climbing training regime for project, nor to an open and intimate relationship. It seemed I needed the escape route. That bolt I could lower off from at a moment's notice in case things did not work out. The issues for which I had created these crutches were long in the past. The crutches, however, remained. The skin on my hands was calloused. Under my arms it was raw. Where once they helped, now they hindered. Like direct aid on very steep limestone, these crutches were not so easy to be rid of. In January 1997, 11 years later, I found myself climbing recreationally in Thailand. I was doing more climbing than I had done since 1990. I started thinking about the possibility of a free East End Boys every day. I mentioned it to no one. My passion was delicate. I knew. It was not possible to force it. However, if I nurtured it, it might grow like a fragile plant. Or is passion just the physical manifestation of naivety and lack of judgment? Will a wise man never fully commit himself with no backup? Passion, almost by definition, implies commitment and risk. When I was a younger man, I was passionate and committed in every aspect of my life. I took some big falls. Sometimes I got hurt. I leaned, I learned to be risk averse, conservative and closed. Was this wisdom or fear? Is this a wise man exercising good judgment or drastically negating new life experiences? I didn't have these answers, but I could feel a desire welling within me. I chortled at the reacquaintance though I feared another painful estrangement. Soon I would unveil the secrets that East End boys had been keeping for over a decade. By March, I was back in Calgary. I bought a membership at the local sport gym and began silently training for East End boys. My fitness level was terrible. I was 30 pounds heavier than I had been in 1986. I rationalized this by convincing myself that I was just a bigger guy than I used to be. <laughs> At the gym, I ran into Andy Jenneru. I knew Andy would be an excellent partner for East End Boys. I had climbed with him in 1988 on the North Face Alahi. He was tough, talented, and tenacious. A veritable climbing pit bull. The lead line, like a dog's leash, always strained for more, for more rope as Andy practically dragged his partners up, route, up routes. He was also a big guy. Climbing with him, I would get fewer comments regarding my own relative girth. I casually suggested that we go and have a look at freeing the route. Within weeks, we were at the base for our first sniff. 
second bolt on pitch two seemed a long way off. I made two apprehensive moves towards it. My windbreaker chafed noisily on the rock as I shuffled into an awkward layback position. A snowflake melted on my glasses. I felt old and fat. I was still 35 feet from the spot where I had used the one point of eight on this pitch 11 years earlier. I whacked in a small knife blade into a tight seam and pulled up on it to reach the bolt muttering, I've already free climbed this part. The number two friend placement I had used for eight in the roof was gone. The blocks had fallen away. I placed the number three behind another block and gave it a cursory tug. The block shifted, then fell to the street, leaving the friend in my hand. Hmm, definitely looser than I remember. I managed to make a baby angle stick and some stacked blocks on the lip. I would have run it out 30 feet on this piece back in the 80s. Now I was concerned that if I fell on it, the blocks would pull loose and then land on me. I lowered off into swirling snowflakes and Annie pulled me into the station. With the rope to my high point, Andy slung his battery-operated buddy over his shoulder and started up. The sound of the drill sent a jolt through my spine as if I were belaying from an electric chair. We were power drilling on East End Boys. Was I making a mistake? Power drills were the norm for building routes nowadays, top down and ground up. I could see how it would definitely make things safer. You could hang off face holds to drill, whereas in the 80s, you had to hang off a hook to complete the same task. Ironically, having to place hooks in order to drill made running it out a safer option in many cases. A bolt drilling session during which I had hung from two hooks tied off in equal tension 30 feet off a station with no other gear and above a leg breaking ramp in the dark on Quantum Leap coincided with my going into retirement in 1990. The power drill would eliminate situations like that. Andy finished the pitch and we wrapped on one rope to the ground, landing at a point 25 feet out from the base of the wall. On our next effort, I aided up the short bolt ladder, made a few more moves of eight above, and hand drilled a bolt. I had not expected to have to drill any more bolts on the route, so we had left the power drill in the car. I lowered off, cleaning a few flakes as I went, got rid of the rack, shook out for an attempt to free the bolt ladder while top roped by the bolt above. This would be my first time rehearsing moves on yam with this solely gymnastic focus. It was only a 15-foot overhanging section, but the holds were conspicuous only by their absence. Was this style an advancement or a regression? It was certainly safer. As I rehearsed the moves, loose flakes broke off, changing the nature of the gymnastics required. The final sequence, once I had it figured out, involved a drop knee at the roof lip, then a dead point to a sloper. I was quite proud of myself as I had only just recently learned the drop knee technique, not to mention the terminology. I carried on past the bolt ladder to terrain that I had free climbed during the first ascent. A big loose block formed another small overhang above. The cracks were rotten. The sides of the cracks crumbled slightly as I tapped a wire in with my hammer. I tapped in another and got a pin. All were barely better than body weight placements. In the old days, stringing a pitch together with pro that would only hold a slip was common. I mumbled my old adage, if you don't put it in, it definitely won't hold. I climbed up under the horrifying block. It was rotten, V-shaped, about the size of a microwave oven, 
and wedged in a slot formed by the corner below. I had put a, I put, I had put a friend behind that. Now I hardly wanted to touch it. I placed a body weight stopper in a small crack in the corner below. You had to use the block. But if it blew with the gear placed in a plumb line underneath it, it might cut the ropes. Was I wiser now or just more timid? I weighted the wire and cleaned off bowl after bowl of limestone cornflakes from the block. I hung there. Another bolt? If I drilled it out to the right, it would at least keep the ropes clear if the block cut loose. But that would be three bolts on a pitch that I'd climbed without them. My ethics were such that if you had to ask the first ascensionist, or my ethics were such that you had to ask the first ascensionist if you ever wanted to add bolts to a pitch that had already been climbed. I wanted another bolt, but I was not particularly willing to give myself permission. I glanced over and was startled by the sight of a set of crutches leaning in the corner. Beside them was a large fellow sitting in plain view in a wheelchair. He looked astonishingly familiar. His voice was husky. You're not as tough as you used to be, Steve. 200 pounds, fat, weak, physically and mentally. And now, drilling on one of your greatest creations. This is akin to Da Vinci spray painting fluorescent orange on the Mona Lisa. Drill another bolt and you'll dream of the days when all you needed was a set of crutches. Face it, you can't handle it. You don't even trust yourself anymore, do you? Andy was patiently belaying below. The sun was gone again. I knew he would be frozen. Was I less of a man to want a bolt here? Eleven years ago, I would not have entertained the idea. Indeed, would have frowned upon it. I caressed the block with my hands. So innocent, but so potentially deadly. The man in the wheelchair grunted, and we stared at each other for a while. He smiled when he realized I would not commit. He tilted his head back and cackled evilly because he knew that was why she had left. I felt cold sweat on my back. The rugosities of the limestone blurred into a placid gray. My fingers found the bolt kit. I could not ignore my intuition and experience. Once the bolt was in, I felt drained. I watched a large, I watched a large snowflake sink into my pile jacket like a hot air balloon deflates into the grass. I'm thrashed, Andy. Whatever you want to do, man, it's a touch chilly. Okay, watch me here. I'm going to have one more solid look at it. Soon I was struggling up the corner. I pulled onto the ledge. The wall opened up here. The big roof was a hundred feet above me. I looked out left. Bill had been sitting right here when he held my 80-foot fall. I had landed right down here beside him. We had intended to be back soon for another visit. I ventured onto pitch four with some trepidation. The pitch had spanked me hard when I was at the top of my game 130 months earlier. I climbed anxiously up to the offhand's crack and yelled down, Hey Andy, this is where I fell off last time. Soon I was at the aid section right below the roof. The rock and protection were excellent here. After working all the moves, I was spread eagled in a big stem staring at the single belay bolt on the wall. It was a tad rusty. 
I recalled arriving here over 4,000 days before. I placed seven small wires and clipped them all into the rope in equal tension. Bill followed and took out the pro in between renditions of and there she was, just a walking down the street, singing do I'm, <laughs> I'm her, she's mine, wedding bells are going to chime. He would stop, look up and say, Jimmy, good lead, Jimmy. This is the hardest fucking rock climb I've ever been on. I appreciated his enthusiasm. It was also apparent that he was openly having fun while he was climbing. This was a new concept to me. Soon I was caught up in Bill's chortles, hoots, and howls, and in return calling him the affectionate Jimmy. I enjoyed the lightheartedness in the face of adversity. I am sure that it helped our effort. Bill and I did not know each other well. We had only climbed once before together. Only later did we admit did, only later did we each admit to independently wondering at the end of every pitch whether the other would want to retreat. The drive, however, was only upward. Unspoken between us was the shared feeling that the rue was worth a bivouac if necessary. Once the changeover was complete at the station, Bill looked at my seven wires and at the roof again, considered, I'm sure, the 80-foot whipper I had taken not an hour earlier, and suggested that we drill a bull. I was totally confident in the station and did not think that we needed one. I also did not want to waste the 15 minutes it would take to drill it. At the same time, I was cognizant of the delicate nature of the climbing partnership, not to mention the fragile nature of the headspace required to climb on hard new ground. Sure, Bill, if you want to. Bill, Big Bill Betts blasted in the bolt in minutes. I watched as Bill took a quick draw, clipped the bolt with a seemingly exaggerated motion, and then clipped the other beaner directly to his harness. He looked at me and said, I'm happy now. <laughs> Bill recalls, yeah. And then you deftly, without any hesitation, removed two of the wires and put them back on the rack. I couldn't say a word. I clipped Bill's old bolt and placed a few wires. The station looked meager, even with the bolt. Andy, tie on the drill. I'm going to drill another bolt at this station. Andy seconded the pitch commenting that the climbing would actually be really good if he weren't so farting gripped. <laughs> At this belay, we were about 40 feet out from the base, with a 10-foot roof above our heads. His only comment as he climbed was about having to take out all my pro. I'm trashing my hands more than I would be on a wall roof. And then with a smile, I'm going to take that hammer of yours away from you so you can't tap your wires in. Well, Andy, experience has taught me that protection doesn't do you any good when it ends up dangling around your ankles, hanging from the rope at your waist after you fall off. This became part of our regular banter on the route. We both knew the potential consequences, the potential consequences of the game we were playing. Andy came up, took a look at the station and said, usually I like to have three bolts at stations like this. As Andy racked up, I thought back to my lead around the roof. Back in 1986. You're on blade, Jimmy. Cool, man. And I was off. Tapping and tying off knife blades in behind expanding flakes and bottoming cracks. The aid was tricky. And I had a rather crude system of aid in those days. Bill recalls, you were probably the only guy who was strong enough to make your system work, but you made it work and you were fast at it. The system involved having three or more beaners clipped into one piece at times and alternatively weighting each one. As a consequence, the beaners would periodically jump around making a sharp snapping sound 
as they jockeyed for position. I was used to this. Bill was not. I could sense <laughs> I could sense Bill flinching and locking off the rope every time one of the beaners jumped. I watched in fascination as Andy climbed. With the power drill, he could tension off a piece below and reach to the limit of his, limit of his extension in order to drill the next bolt. This was fully three feet higher than would have been possible from the same piece with a hand drill. Of course, from a bolt, it was possible to top step aggressively and even exert outward pressure on the bolt as opposed to having to hang from the manky tied off blade placed behind suspect flakes. He was through this section in what seemed like minutes. I was startled by how easy the bolt gun made it. Andy placed three bolts on the aid section. This was the one portion of the route where I had expected to have to add bolts. He then lowered down, dropped off the drill, and prepared to try to free it on a top rope. I was concerned about the big roof. I had always thought this would be the crux. I knew everything else was free climbable, but the big roof. What if it was 513? Andy and I did not climb it that great. Yet we had done all the work down below. If it was 513, then some stick man could come along and bag the free ascent. In disbelief, I watched as Andy, as Andy effortlessly floated up the pitch to the top bolt. Andy, how hard is it? Well, it's 5'8", or 5'11". Really? You ran up it. Well, I knew where all the holds were. Some of the hollow flakes I knocked off left jugs underneath. I was ecstatic. We had it. It was bagged. The hard climbing was over. Her next effort would cinch it, and the big roof was a jug tug. Soon we returned for the free attempt. The large fellow in the wheelchair followed close on my heels up the trail. This guy could get anywhere in that damn wheelchair. You think you can climb two hard routes over two days on Yam? You're already tired, aren't you? blew your wad yesterday, and this climb is harder. And, he chuckled, popped a wheelie in his chair, and balancing on two wheels, made a quick spin while shrieking, and you can't fall off today or hang. It doesn't count if you do. He continued his two-wheeled spin and began to chant like a little kid in time with his rotations. You're going to hang, you're going to hang. Andy was raring to go. He pegged the red point on pitch two. To save my jam for the leads, I followed on Jumars and rigged up for the 512 pitch. I got the micro hold, made the drop knee, but blew off the sloper. The man in the wheelchair squealed as the rope came tight and grinned as he nudged the pair of crutches in the corner a little closer to me. I hung, shook out, completed the pitch. Andy seconded flawlessly and fired up pitch four. At the off-hands crack, he greased off and took a shorty. He was back on instantly and sent the aid section to the station. I again followed on the Jumars. My friend in the chair was further delighted when I dogged my way over the big roof. At least it was only a hundred feet of five seven to the station, or so I recalled. I fought for half an hour to get through a loose five ten section above the roof, which completely took me by surprise. I had previously graded this section five seven. Pitch six pitch six was the last bit of aid yet to be freed. It was Andy's lead. I stared up at his as I belayed and recalled. I was getting tired and retorted to Bill. Do you ever notice how the climb is never over when you want to be? 
Bill chuckled. What? Have you had enough? As he grabbed the rack and started up the pitch. With no other protection in Bill Leapfrog, number four friends on aid up the wide overhanging crack. I lay sprawled on the sloping ledge below. I started to attention when I heard the sound of a friend ripping across limestone and the clatter of gear. As I looked up, my mind shot to the integrity of our belay station. A friend had pulled and Bill had fallen onto the lower one, but the rope had, cut, had not come tight. His cowtail sling had held the fall. Bill instantly plugged in the other friend and quickly free climbed for another 30 feet to a ledge on the left where he began ferreting out a station. The sound of iron on iron rang out into the afternoon as Big Bill Betts pounded in a solid belay. A jumard passed the overhanging crack, racked up and continued to blow another small river. You know, Bill, Every pitch on this route is either overhanging or has an overhang in it. Bill concurred as he directed my attention briefly to the bent carabiner on his harness. I had to open the gate with my hammer. Hey Andy, get some gear in before the wide crack, will you? Andy expertly manipulated the wide crack to his advantage. He was climbing strongly with confidence as he gave me a full running commentary of the moves. For a brief instant, it felt as if we were totally in control, just finishing off a fun in the sun rock climb. Andy's tone alerted me before I could comprehend the words, Steve, rock! A shower of toaster-sized howitzers filled the sky. I hugged the wall, still totally exposed, hunching my shoulders and bulldogging my neck. Crack, thud, one on the helmet, one on the shoulder. I heard Andy's concerned voice as a background to the fireworks in front of my eyes. I shook my head and felt my shoulder and collarbone. Nothing broken, just numb. I'm okay. And then muttered to myself, this is still a very serious game. A cloud of dust extended in a plume behind us as we drove into the Yam parking lot. It was early and the parking lot was empty, save for one person, the man in the wheelchair. He sat there waiting and glowered at me over his coffee mug. As we got out of the truck, he tossed a pair of crutches in my general direction. They fell to the ground with a clatter. You don't feel good, do you? mentally waxed, emotionally drained. Things are not great at home right now, are they? You think you can red point a 512 pitch today? He laughed. You've never red pointed a 512, and you think you can pull it off three pitches off the deck on Mount Yanuska? Squared off momentarily and prepared to butt heads, but then backed off. I needed to save it for the route. Andy resent pitch two in minutes. After following the game on the GMRs, I quietly ate an eat more bar and had a drink as I selected the rack for the pitch. No hammer, no pins, a few wires, and some big stuff for up high. I clipped the first bolts, begin with the two finger layback to the sharp micro hole. Then drop me and slap for the sloper. Got it. Okay, stay low on it so you don't barn door off. I brought my left foot above the roof and began to stand. The flake it was on snapped off, but my arms took the weight and I held on. I had nanoseconds to respond or I would be off. Auntie pointed. Foothold! Just under the roof! Just under the lip there was a hidden foothold that I could not see. It made the difference. I armed my way up to the pseudo rest. I had done it. Finally pulled the crux without blowing off. Now there was only the easy 511 section past the loose block. Andy shouted encouragement from below. It went. 
and soon I clipped the belay bolts and let out a howl. I, had let out, I hadn't let out a howl on the crag in a long time. The large man fidgeted in his chair. Andy seconded, seconded, refusing the offer of the Jumars. He fired his pitch to the big roof, this time bypassing the wide crack on some face holds to the right. Two red points down, one to go. Now for the big roof. I made the moves past all three bolts and was into the overhanging flare above. There was a good stopper crack right in front of my nose. Do I stop and put one in? Keep going to the rest. My arms and legs burned from the contorted stem position. As I was getting arranged, my left hold blew. I swung right but resisted with my stem. You all right? I was out of Andy's view. Yeah, a hold popped but I didn't fall. The exposure pulled at my heels. My butt was now 50 feet out from the base of the wall. The rocks were landing outside the trail at the base. I got the stopper in and climbed another four feet higher. Two more moves to the rest. Once again, the rock on my left tore away in my hands. I was off. My legs swung wildly into space, but the hold on my right was good. I dug, deep, I dug deep into my psyche, 11 years into the past, when I was an East End wild boy, when the healthy dissatisfaction that I lived with daily spurred me on to bigger, better, and increasingly more improbable projects, when I roared on protect, protectionless pitches and howled at the face of adversity, I became that person again. The doors blew off every compartment I had ever created. I felt all. My body pulsed as new blood surged. The crutches turned to ash in the corner. My feet darted to new positions. My eyes squinted, then focused like laser beams on the remaining holds, almost burning holes into the rock. The piece at my shins swung ever so gently. The man in the wheelchair stood up in disbelief. A few moves higher at the rest, I got some pro in, quickly shrunk back to my timid self, and made my way slowly and methodically to the station. The man in the wheelchair sat back down, magically produced another pair of crutches, and gently, tauntingly, tauntingly placed them in the corner. Her eyes locked once more. I hissed, only if I need them, you bastard. East End Boys was free. Me? Well, I'm working on it. My 17-year-old Toyota Tercel roared down 16th Avenue towards town. My body had the pleasant soreness from the effort of the climb the day before. As I pulled over, stepped out to pick up some soup cans from a recycling box at the roadside. I realized that the suit I was wearing was worth more than the car. I ate out a lot and did not like canned soup anymore. I would, however, need these tins to cover the holes in my exhaust system. I tossed the shiny cans into the back with a clatter, readjusted my silk tie, and buckled up. You never know when a wheel might fall off. Thank you for joining us for this reading of the East End Boys, first published in 1998 in the Canadian Alpine Journal, later published in my collection of short stories called The Rage, Reflections on Risk. Thank you. I'll see you next time.